What's up guys, Kyle here again, and we have reached yet another Fact and Friday. This week makes number 15, and I have been doing this since the first week that I started my channel. So that means I'm almost four months into this thing, and we are 15 subscribers away from 2,000 subs. That is crazy to me. You guys are the absolute best and I appreciate all your support along the way. Seriously, this has been so much fun for me. I'm really glad I finally decided to take the leap and start the channel. It's been nothing but a good experience for me so far. So thank you guys so much for your support. Special shout out to my Patreon members, Mike, Michael, Alan, and Adam. Seriously, thank you guys so much. I appreciate it. I'm still blown away by all that stuff, but we're gonna keep this episode a little shorter. So let's get to those questions. First question comes from Cam the Man. Hey Kyle, love your content, my man. My question for next week is, what are your thoughts on the crank amps? I have a very, very sh brief, sh brief, brief relationship with crank. I've told this story a couple times on my channel already, but essentially I traded a Kerry King JCM 800 for a crank rev one and it died one day after I got it and the tech was never able to fix it. So I got my money back out of it, but couldn't get the amp back because it was already gone. So anyways, I've had one more crank amp since then, the Chadwick, and didn't love it. People said it was supposed to be this awesome hot rodded Marshall. I didn't really get that vibe from it. I just thought it was kind of like a meh, uh, middle of the road, kind of farty sounding Marshall thing. So. Wasn't really my thing. I definitely would like to get some of the Plus Series amps on here though. I've heard that they have fixed a lot of the issues that they had with the earlier Krankenstein and the Rev 1 in the Plus Series. And plus they also have 6550 or KT88 tubes, which I love those power tubes. So they sound interesting to me based off that alone. So yeah, I'll definitely get some of the Plus Series crank stuff on here in the future, but I don't really have a lot of experience with them as of right now. Leo Chang asks, Hey Kyle, have you tried the Angle Powerball? Thoughts? Thanks. Yeah, I had the Powerball 1, and I think I've also mentioned this before, but I could not stand that amp, man. It was ridiculously fizzy and compressed, and it just sounded kind of like a solid state amp to me, but worse. Like, there were solid state amps that I'd rather play any day of the week before I would play a Powerball one again. Just being completely honest, it's not my thing. I haven't had a chance to play the two yet. I've heard that the two has improved, but kind of still suffers from a lot of the same issues. So I don't know. I mean, it, it might be cool. The one that I had just didn't sound good. And I dropped a 12 AT7 into V1 to try and tame some of the gain and fizz because it was just like over the top. And that helped. It made the amp more usable for sure. But in the end, it just, in my opinion, I know some of the amps that you have, man. I've seen your pictures. Stay far away from the Powerball. Uh, maybe check out the Fireball, or I have an Angle Savage 120. The Savage 120 is dope. Check out one of those two, but I would say stay away from the Powerball. My personal opinion. Okay, my man Nick Harper asks, do you like signature guitars? And if so, do you have any favorites? I've always been partial to Jeff Hanneman ESPs and Dimebags Washburn slash Deans, especially the Dime from Hell models. Yeah, I definitely like uh, signature guitars, as long as they're not too signature, you know what I mean? Like, there's definitely signature guitars out there that, like, have somebody's logo or, or maybe even their name or something on it. Like, all of the uh, James Hetfield LTD models look hideous to me. They're just very much uh, late James Hetfield styled guitars, and I just can't get into those, but... Um, I own a couple signature guitars for some guys. I have the LTD Bill Kelleher BK600, and that's one of my favorite guitars. Not only is it an awesome design, a full thickness EC1000 with a military green satin burst and his pickups, which I love his pickups. It's just an awesome guitar all around. So I'm really happy with that one. I own a couple of the Keith Marrow uh, KM6s, or actually I just sold the KM61, but I had the KM62 as well and I have a KM63 standard. I love pretty much every Keith Marrow model I've got my hands on. I think he he definitely knows how to design a very solid guitar, and they seem to get better with the progression, although the KM6 Mark II was my favorite. That thing was ridiculous. Kind of wish I still had it. There are a couple other signature models from guys that I either would love to try or try to track down sometime. The Brendan Small Thunder Horse, Explorer comes to mind for sure. Uh, the Silver Burst Explorer, how do you, you know, Silver Burst for one, 
Silver Burst is the best. There's there's no argument there. It's the best. And Explorers are awesome. You guys see me use my white Explorer all the time. So that one I've always thought is a killer guitar. Brent Hines Epiphone V, Silver Burst V. You know, that one's that one's dope as well. I had one, but the one I had, uh, no bueno. It was it was just not a good example, but I would like to find another one and, and hope that it's better. Mine, I had the bridge screwed all the way down to the body and the strings were still like a mile off the fretboard. So obviously Epiphone missed that one in QC, but I would love to try another someday. Another one that I really want to get my hands on. Actually, there's two that you might not think, but the Izzy Hale Explorer, dude, that thing is dope. I would play that all day long. Girl has good taste. That Explorer is awesome. The other is the Tommy Thayer White Explorer with the white get, or white Duncan JB in it. It's like a white sparkle almost. Dude, I'd play the hell out of that guitar. That guitar is awesome. And I should have bought one when I found it on eBay for 400 bucks because the prices have kind of gone through the roof. So those are all awesome examples of people's signature guitars that aren't like too overtly belonging to the people that have designed them. A couple other examples would be Jason Frankhauser, Killer Tone Texas is. Texas is, 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 Killer Tone Texas is. I don't know if that's right. I don't care. Jason Frankhauser's signature, Solar Guitars. Absolutely killer design. Uh, would love to get one of those in and play it on the channel here at some point. The Alex Skolnick Silver Burst LTD AS1, I think is the model number. Another awesome one. So yeah, I'm definitely down with signature guitars. Uh, the Reba model through LTD from Code Orange. Very deep ties to Pittsburgh hardcore. I got a lot of friends down there, go down there for, all the time for shows. So I love to see that Code Orange is doing so well and to see somebody from the hardcore scene get their own signature guitar is, is honestly awesome. So congratulations to her, she earned it. And I think her LTD Viper model is actually really dope. And I'd love to get my hands on one of those at some point too. All right, so next question comes from Danny Eichelberger. Sorry, bro. I have heard you talk about lunchbox amps with the EL84 tube complement not cutting in, in a live mix unless mic'd out. I agree with you and would like to hear your opinion of what amps you prefer live and stand out in a mix. Most of the shows we did back in the day did not have a great PA and a good 100 watt head with a 4x12 was a must. Um, it really comes down to the voicing of the amp. I mean, those lunchbox amps will probably do just fine if they're mic'd. They'll sit in a mix fine. I mean, those lunch, uh, the EVH lunchbox amps. They sound just like the bigger ones, but it's when you start to push the power tubes that they, the EL84s just have such an early breakup that they tend to fall apart at louder volumes if you're only running two at 15 watts. So they'll sit in the mix just fine, but if you're talking like an unmiked deal, amps that are guaranteed to cut through the mix are pretty much anything Marshall and pretty much anything PV. I've always trusted those brands to sit where they need to sit in the mix because they both have a signature upper mid-range thing going on different from each other but both amps tend to or both amp companies tend to design their amps with a big upper mid spike in their voicing that sits really well in a mix i've never had a problem cutting through with a marshall or marshall based amps a la my splons that i use for bushido code Never had a problem sitting in the mix or out front of the mix with a 5150 or PV Ultra Series amp. So those amps are definitely go-tos if I know I'm playing with another guitarist and I know that I'm gonna have to compete against their frequencies. I'll choose one of those pretty much every time just because I know that, that those types of amps cut no problem. Now, if I'm playing by myself, you have a little bit more leeway because you can have amps that don't necessarily like dominate a mix that still sit well in the mix. My Diesel Herbert, a lot of people say that those are scooped. It's kind of a trick to running the mids on that. You know, you turn your mids up, but you turn the mid cut on, intensity down, level up, and that actually spikes your upper mids, and that sits well in a mix. Also, the VHT stuff has no problem sitting well in a mix. So, I mean, there are amps that really kind of sit out front of the mix without overtaking it and that's the Marshall and the PV stuff. But if you're okay with your guitar tones kind of like blending in with everything a little bit more and not being quite so out front, then there's plenty of options, man. There's there's tons of stuff, but those are my choices. I mean, anything old PV, anything Marshall or Marshall based is always gonna sit you in the right place. All right, so Mike Schreiber, 
Have you had any experience with the Badlander 100 yet? If so, any tonal differences between the 50 model and the 100? For example, I thought the EVH 5153-6L6 100 watt head was not as growly as the 50 watt version. I would not want to sacrifice tone for more power. I'm close to pulling the trigger on a 50, but I do like the extra punch of a 100 watt head. I don't have any experience with the 100 watt Badlander yet. I have kind of been like a proponent of 50 watt amps because today in the venues that most people are playing, they're either mic'd on a stage where you really can't turn up anything crazy loud or you're in a small venue where again, you can't turn up crazy loud. You can turn up loud, but you're not gonna be uh, trying to fill a massive hall with no miking. So 100 watt heads, the, he the extra headroom is great depending on what you're doing, but in most cases, it's, it's really not necessary whatsoever. Um, unless you're playing like super low drop tune stuff where you kind of need the headroom because those low notes really push the output transformers beefier output transformers from the 100 watt heads just kind of helps keep things together a little bit more but overall i've been using 50 watt heads live for a really long time and the only one that i've ever had a problem with is the mesa single rectifier and a lot of people that i've talked to have had the same issues with those the power sections in those amps are just crap they just fart out as soon as you start to push them and not only did mine do it my other guitarist did it when we went to record we turned it up at a decent volume and it just sounded like it we wanted to shake the cab apart, but it wasn't the cab because we plugged it into another cab and it sounded the same way. It was just the power section in those amps are not good unless you don't have to turn them up very loud. So yeah, 50 watts, in my opinion, I don't think that you're going to hear a huge tonal difference in the 100 versus the 50 unless Mesa actually designed something different in the preamp circuit on the 100 than they did on the 50. But I don't think that's the case with the EVH stuff. Those actually are slightly different circuits between the 150 watt uh, models, depending on which ones you get. So you're gonna notice differences there, but they're not gonna be attributed solely to the power section. They're more so attributed to the design of the amp. The blue channel on the 6L650 watt is a little bit more low mid bass than it is on the 100 watt. The 100 watts a little bit more open and a little bit more present in the upper mids than the 50 watt is. So. That's just part of the design. That's not the result of 50 versus 100 watts. So take it as you will. I think, I know we talked today and you said you ordered the 100 watts. So I hope you dig it, man. I'm genuinely curious. A lot of people want me to compare the 100 to the 50. So I'll try and locate 100 locally at some point. It probably won't happen anytime soon, but eventually I'll, I'll see if there is a big difference in the tone between the 50 and 100 watt Badlander. Cause I'm curious myself, Mesa says that the 100 watts supposed to be thicker and fuller in the low mids. So. Is there something different in the circuit? Are they just attributing those differences to the power section? All right, guys, that's going to do it for me this week. If I did not get to your question, it is either A, because it was formed in a way that I couldn't quite answer it, or B, it's because it's something I've already answered a few times. So drop it in the comments for next week, and I will try to get to it next week, I promise. I love having all the questions from you guys. I really look forward to answering it and seeing what you guys are going to ask me. I want to start doing something at the end of these FAQ videos where I suggest you guys check out either a new single or a new up and coming band or check out one of the classic hardcore bands that kind of like shaped my musical taste and my play style. I just thought it'd be kind of a fun thing to tack on at the end of these episodes and you guys can see the type of stuff that I dig. If you're not really into hardcore all that much, for the first week that we're doing this, I want you guys to check out a band called God's Hate and the single is called Be Harder. A lot of hardcore guys are probably familiar with this band because it's the Young Brothers from Twitching Tongues who is a huge hardcore i guess you could call them a hardcore band they exist within the hardcore scene but they're kind of more of like a life of agony almost like a hard rock type band that's like life of agony slash typo negative uh you know with their own thing going on but anyways god's hate is those two brothers with a couple other guys and it's almost like a marauder <laughs> worship band i've always kind of described it as it's like a more modern and heavier marauder if you're familiar with them i've loved this band since their inception and they just put out a couple new singles. So check out the new single, Be Harder by God's Hate. Let me know in the comments what you guys think of that stuff. And next week, I will drop another album for you guys to check out. All right. Thanks again, guys. Kyle here again. We'll see you next week.